Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Malcolm Thomas, the President-Elect of Vincosa UK, and I'd like to welcome you to the first of our ASEC 2021 reserve paper presentations. Now, as a little bit of background, you might not know, but for each ASEC, we ask for about three, two to three authors to prepare presentations in reserve, just in case the, a scheduled presentation has a problem. Um, these reserve papers are published in the proceedings, and now we are giving the authors a chance to present their papers to our membership. So today, I'd like to introduce Tom Ogden, who is going to present his paper, and this is a long title, <laughs> <laughs> bringing, bringing the Seven Samurai to Life, Managing Complexity and Capability Delivery Through Time Using Systems Thinking. So Tom is a Principal Consultant at PA Consulting, He's over 15 years of experience as a systems engineer and enterprise architect, and predominantly working in defense and security se sectors. He's worked across all phases of the life of the system life cycle and has an interest in capability and life cycle management. He is currently working as an enterprise architect in the defense and security sector, using systems thinking and engineering techniques to aid prioritization of decisions and simplify complexity for senior leaders. And that final thing is a very good thing to do because they, <laughs> they, they do need to be able to make decisions from very complex data and information. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll have some time at the end for questions. Um, but now over to you, Tom, and uh, well, looking forward to hearing it. Thank you, Malcolm. And thank you everyone for joining uh, this lunchtime. Um, so I really appreciate the chance to present the paper after preparing it. Um, and as, as Joe said, I think just before the keynote on the second day of ASEC, I think we were three seconds away from having to substitute in. So um, a bit nervous still, but um, yeah, really happy to present this. So I'm just going to share my screen now. And so this is my uh, paper that we present. We're going to present on um, bringing, this, bringing the Seven Samurai to life. Um, and really, it's the application of the systems thinking framework against the large scale system of systems to help understand how we can show how capability is delivery through its lifetime. Um, I'm going to touch on a few topics today, so I'll just run through the context very quickly. I'd like to first of all introduce the context of the case of the example we're going to use and touch on a couple of concepts that are key, uh, key themes throughout the paper. I'll then talk about how we went around looking at a systems thinking framework, what factors we use to assess whether it's suitable for our use, and talk about those and how important they are. I'd then like to show how we use, in this case, the Seven Samurai framework to represent the current state of our case study example, and then how we use the twist of the framework slightly to help represent the system of systems through time. I'll then talk more specifically about the realization and sustainment systems through that time across what we've called epochs in this paper. And then talk about results and key benefits from the work. And then I'll wrap up with some conclusions. So first of all, I'd like to introduce the context. So we could consider that enterprise capability is an emergent property of large scale complex system of systems. We deliver these system of systems through large programs, portfolios, and we partition them up at an logical level to help produce chunks of deliverable stuff. And they, these things are often driven by technology decisions or funding and dependent on the type of thing being delivered, they're delivered in their own life cycle, managed through their own delivery methodology. Splitting up is one thing, bringing them back together and visualizing how they come back together is often difficult. And you've also got the issue of each partition, because it's following its own life cycle and delivery method, can fo focus on its own objectives rather than the holistic ones of the system of system. Therefore, these sort of programs do carry a risk that a change in one or more of those partitions, such as in scope, time or quality, has an impact on the emergent capability we want from the entire system of systems. And that's sometimes really hard to quantify and sometimes even unknown. And this can leave programs paralyzed not being able to make decisions. So in this presentation, I want to discuss how we use some system thinking frameworks and how we looked at them before applying specifically Seven Samurai to our example system of systems here, which is a satellite communications system of systems. 
I want to discuss the benefits of the approach, and this included the ability to define epochs or periods of time um, which were event driven for particular configurations of, a system, of the system of systems. How this thinking actually helped inform test evaluation and acceptance of the overall emergent capability, showing a trace from the deployments that we're making back to the problem they're trying to solve. And then also looking at how we identify and prioritize problems that actually require solving based on their criticality, timeliness and scale. And this helps inform how you might deploy your resource, how you might deploy your funding. But before we go into the case study, I just want to touch on two key concepts within the paper, so just so I can define them for you now. The first one is around viewpoints and epochs. So when we describe a system of systems, we often draw holistic snapshots of a particular point in its time. And this is also seen in enterprise architecture and in business change through methods such as TOGAF and AGCAR, which both advocate you draw in an as is what you have and a 2B viewpoint of the system of systems or the business or the enterprise. We then generate roadmaps, usually through the petitioning of those delivery efforts as mentioned before, to show dependencies from a P3M viewpoint of what you need to deliver them. We wanted to try and use systems thinking to draw a jigsaw box cover of the system of systems, the, the thing that tells you how it fits back together and visualize that through time. But the box cover will evolve through time. And we're using the term epochs in this sense, which is, which is taken from defense cap capability thinking. It's a well-defined term within that, that sector. As a period where the capability is emerging from our system of systems is relatively stable. But at each end of those epochs, we've got change events, and that drives how the jigsaw box cover changes and therefore will be different for each of those epochs. On the note of change, the other concept I want to sort of raise, is it still the same system of systems if I change something? And this is a, so to maintain that capability that's been delivered, we will replace, upgrade, add, decommission component systems and parts through time while still attempting to fulfill capability requirements, which constantly change due to the operational environment changing and the customer demand. Here, if you consider Theseus's ship, the thought experiment that uh, was eventually made famous by Plutarch, the, the question there is if I have a full ship and I take a wooden plank out and I replace it, and then I take another wooden plank out and I replace it, and I do that for every part of the ship, at the end of the ship, at the, at the end of that process, have I a new ship or is it still Theseus's ship? And this thought experiment was then extrapolated into such things as the grandfather's axe uh, problem and also made famous by Trigger in the Trigger's Broom um, of Only Fools and Horses. But it's a really useful problem to consider when dealing with system system through time as it helps when considering those epochs. And I'll come back to this later in the presentation. I'd like now to talk about the approach we use to look at the different frameworks that are available. So best practice from the CBOC suggests using such a framework, such as the Seven Samurai, can ensure that all aspects of a system or system are considered so you can understand and manage that complexity. There was a useful paper, the Nine System paper by Cass and Zhao from 2014, which looked at several different systems thinking models and addressed them by what viewpoints they provided. I provided a snapshot of the table here. I really recommend looking at this uh, paper and, and, and finding the table. I, I can't take credit for that work. But it helped us provide a good measure of completeness for each framework. What views do you think you need to draw? What systems do you think you need to capture? And not all of them will be able to have everything in it but knowing what you might need to show and assessing it against might help you choose from a completeness point of view, which systems thinking framework might be useful for you. However, we believe this wasn't the most important factor. We believe the most important, important factor was the communicability of that framework. So we looked at the language that was being used. And this is because as Malcolm referred to in his introduction, some of our decision makers in large programs are not often systems engineers or potentially natural systems thinkers. 
if we took them a highly theoretical and abstractive model, which they just didn't understand, didn't, didn't, the language didn't resonate, I'm not going to use the phrase doesn't understand, the language doesn't resonate, it can result in the thinking being dismissed, in which case it's useless. We've done all the thinking, it doesn't land, so therefore we haven't, we haven't achieved any value. In our sense, we selected Seven Samurai because it had a good amount of coverage, and had the, but it had the easiest to explain language. The hardest concept that we had was the idea of an intervention system, which we'll touch on later. But we use language such as, you've got it, you want this, you want it, and the build it systems. And also the classic, this is the machine that builds the machine, allows such concepts to land. And so when assessing your systems thinking frameworks for use, I'd highly look at how easy it is to get the insights across based on your customers or your decision makers and have the completeness as a secondary thing of have I got everything? And um, you can add to that uh, iteratively. So as I said, we, we selected seven samurai as a, a test. And what we wanted to do was test to see if it would, would work within the context of the, the, the SATCOM system of systems. So we took it to try and represent the current state. Um, and just as a very quick primer, I thought I'd just talk, talk through the seven samurai framework and the systems it defines as things to consider when applying, when applying it. So the first system is the context system. This is where the problem resides that needs to be solved. And the context system contains everything around that problem that either is contributing to it, trying to solve it, um, integrating with it, it could be described in the operational environment that it's, work, it's working in, in terms of either climate or digital, physical, whatever it might be. And you can sort of see this being articulated usually in say OV1s from MODAF or um, as these diagrams in TOGAF. And also um, you might find these in documents such as concepts of operations or concepts of deployment, where you're describing the problem. System two is then the intervention system. This is the system we intend to deploy to address the problem. The intervention system is an abstract system. It never really exists. It's more of the design, the prototypes, the things we're trying to test to prove whether the intervention will event do what we expect it to do with the problem. But it's the main focus of a, of a, of a project. And that project is take or program takes the form of a realization system. This develops and deploys system two. And that realization system is a people-based system of processes and methods and tools in order to generate the intervention. That realization system eventually generates a deployed system. This is now a real thing. It has a part number, it has bits, it integrates in the operational environment. It instantiates the S2 within the, the S1 context system. But now we've instantiated it within the context system, we actually end up modifying that context system. By deploying something itself, we have changed the context system now with our, with our S4. And also time has passed between us deciding to do something with our S2 and actually deploying. And that time passing might have changed the environment. So again, S1 star is the thing we are trying to get to. But within S1 star, our deployments, all the changes in the environment may have caused new problems to arise. Within the context system as well, we've got a collaborating system or, or many of them, which interact with our deployed system S4 to accomplish its or their own goals. These are really important because we need to understand how we interface with them, what goals they're trying to achieve and how we can help and vice versa, how they can help us. Then we have a sustainment system which provides services and materials to the S4, the thing that is uh, keeping it alive during its operational lifetime. And often these sustainment systems will also have to be generated by the realization system. And finally, and the most important one I, I feel sometimes is the competing system. And this isn't trying to adversarially attack S4, it's not competing in that way. What it's trying to do is solve the same problem that we are. And if that props competing system can solve the problem in a better, more efficient way, then that will be the system that lives on and it will take up resources uh, from the other systems as well. 
identifying those early, turning them into collaborating systems where possible is a key element of actually the framework. Um, so that's a, a, a key point that I, I really like about Seven Samurai. But that's great, but how do we actually apply that? That's, that's words on a page, it's a table, and you can find the uh, reference to the actual paper um, attached to the paper right at the back of this presentation. But we wanted to apply it to our SATCOM system. So we drew pictures like this. This is just S1, S2, and S3. So the context, the intervention, and the realization system for a, an example satellite communication system. The context system is divided into four segments, which is based off expert domain knowledge from all working here. Um, the relay segment or the space segment where messages will get carried, the management segment, which manages the rest of the assets within the system, the ground segment, which helps work, uh, manage the assets on the ground, and the user segment where people are actually going to consume the service that's provided. We highlighted these boxes in grey as being things that we own, our system of control, whereas the rest of it is our system of systems, our systems of interest, which we have not, may not have control over. But we can see here there are two problems, P1 and P2. The first one up here, P2, is one of the space assets is degrading. Its operational lifetime is coming to an end. And in order to maintain capability and coverage, it needs a replacement. Another problem down here is the service provision contract is coming to an end. The operational model wants to be changed due to budget constraints. So how do we solve a problem of making sure we've got an operational um, unit management unit here, both from the actual owner and the service provider? These two problems we represented then in the intervention system, and we talked about a concept called capability events. Things we want to generate in the system of systems that help solve that problem. So in the case of C1 here, we're trying to launch a new space asset. And these PEs, these program events, are things that the program is going to generate for its efforts in the realization system in order to solve this problem. Similarly, down here, you've got the maintenance of the service itself, but also negotiations and a transformation going on within the organization which both contribute to a capability event of being able to run, it, uh, run the, the SATCOM service um, and maintain that going forward, which will hopefully solve this problem. So it's a really useful way of articulating the things the program is doing at a very high level back to the problem they're trying to solve. We could then draw the S4, S5, S6, next 7 which are within this modified context system now. So, now you can see here our deployed system, the updated space asset, and our new service provision and the SATCOM operator. It's all gone well. We're assuming that's the intervention we want to make, they're the deployments that we've made. However, time has moved on. So we have new platforms we need to consider within the user segment, new terminals that we need to interoperate with. So there's a new problem that's being formed there. The deployed networks themselves, which carry the messages further on land, have also been updated, so we need to make sure they're interoperable with these new deployed networks. We have successfully updated a space asset. However, as with all things, another space asset is going to be needing to be replaced soon. And it's operating in a new operational environment because the space debris is getting worse as time goes on within the orbit. We're not the only ones deploying satellites. There are some collaborating systems here in satellites that we can use. Um, but there's also competing systems as well, because they're competing for our orbit slots. So how do we make sure that we can solve this problem and turn either turn them into collaborating systems or get there first? And then finally, it's often common practice within the SATCOM domain to front load capability in the space assets because it takes a long time to launch one. So in order to unlock this latent capability, we'll need to update the ground station to unlock further frequency bands going forward. So this is our S1 star. This is the situation we're going to create. And this helps identify the, the aims, I suppose, and then the new problems that we're going to solve in the future. So using the language of interventions, we could articulate elements that 
that was going on within the program tied to the resolution of problems. As I said, the launch of a new space asset or the transformational change required by both the operator and service provider. We articulated problems as capability events, which then we would need to be able to create through the delivery of interventions in the S2. And then we could represent deliveries that contribute to them as program events, which are part of the intervention delivered by an element of the S3, the realization system. And this allowed us to show those relationships. So that's one system of systems. That's one instance going from point A to point B with two interventions. What we wanted to show was further because all those problems still need solving and they may need to, uh, addressing sooner rather than later. The Seven Samurai framework itself doesn't really have an explicit time axis. There's that assumption that time passes between the S2 and the S4 instantiation. But there is no assumption as to how the other systems change during this time. I go back now to that concept about Plutarch's ship and Trigger's broom. By treating each epoch as its own system of systems in this sense, we could assume that we could apply the seven samurai framework to each potential epoch and make sure we've got the relevant systems. And we could take the S1 star created in the previous epoch and use it as the S1 for the next. And I'll just try and show you that for a diagram now. So here we see our epoch one, which is what we articulated in the previous set of slides, where we've inst we have um, interventions of S2 created in S4, supported by our, our sustainment system and competing with the S7s. And this has created this new S1 star here. Our next epoch then has created two problems and therefore we've got more interventions that we need to make. So this is then gonna create a new S1 star, in this case, S13 over here. And similarly at the end, so this, this is kind of the system of systems that's generating that stable set of capability for that epoch. And similarly, again, a new problem has arisen, either due to us or environmental um, uh, reasons. And that's now gonna be tackled and then solved here to generate the next epoch going forward. This actually really helps with test and evaluation. Because we can define the capability and program events here, we know the things that we are necessary in order to generate this, this stable system of systems. So therefore, we can tie that into test evaluation to know that when these things occur and the program has delivered the relevant evidence, we can combine that evidence and test at a high level of capability emerging from the system of systems. What also is removed is the dates. Often within epoch definition, you'll see epoch one will start in 2020 and finish in 2025. But that's defined arbitrarily by the program and potential need. But actually the epoch won't start in 2025. It will start when these capability, this deployment, this S4 is instantiated. So therefore we're defining the epochs by events rather than by calendar dates. Applying this to SATCOM, our first epoch ended, as I say, when the new service provision was in place and a new space asset is operational and in orbit. In the following epoch, we now have terminals and platforms that need updating to realize that potential capability in the space asset, as well as that ground station. All of this against the backstrop of further space assets needing replacing or that future, and meet, trying to meet that future demand. And these are problems that are being formed within that context system. Showing these issue, issues and then showing the next interventions that are going to address them to create a new future context system started to allow for dependencies between those interventions to be captured, i.e. I need this ground station in so in the next epoch we can, we can realise the latent capability that was launched in the previous space asset. But then looking further into this, it didn't quite feel right about where the realization and the sustainment system sit. Because a realization system could be generating interventions that affect multiple system one S1 stars and generating multiple S4s at the same time. 
So it's an example picture here. I've taken out the S3 from this epoch timeline. S31 here is generating interventions here, which help solve this problem within the um, S41. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to the wrong screen, apologies. So S21 is solving problem one to generate this deployment here, which then helps uh, create this S1 star. But it's also addressing a future problem, which is, is it, is it going to come to fruition to this epoch here? And this may be because these two problems are relatively similar and these require the necessary, the S31 has the relevant skills to do it. It also may be that this intervention P3 or P3 requires a longer concept and development time. So therefore the program has to start doing something now in order for it to ensure it, it can solve the problem at the right time. Similarly, S32 is also doing the same. And S32 is separate because these might be have a different set of skills and methodologies that need to be set up within this or this S3 in order for these problems to be solved. And this is where it gets interesting where you're thinking that actually the realization system may need to be creating a new realization system to solve problems in the future. Finally, the, uh, from a sustainment system point of view, it may be that a sustainment system doesn't need to change across epochs. It might be that it's suitable enough, in this case, for, from S6 to support both S41 and S42. But in the future, it will need to change. So there's some effort needed to derive an S6 here to support S43 in the future. And this, when you apply it to SATCOM, you can really see the understanding that this might be a new space asset and therefore needs to be started back here in order to meet that, make sure we meet it in a timely manner while we're trying to deal with near term problems at the same time. But we also need to make sure we transform into something that can generate and maintain provision of the service in the future epochs. And we might need to start thinking about that now as well. And this is just some, summarising that concept here that at the moment the development of a future space asset is controlled by the same programme, delivering near-term service rider change and replacement space asset to maintain capability. It will need to transform in the future to deliver further support to that future space asset, maintain service provision and intervene on the, in the other segments as well in order to increase its capability and meet that greater demand. Viewing the entirety of the interventions allowed for those epochs to be defined concurrent with a programmatic viewpoint of when, who, who is delivering what and to what an epoch they're actually delivering to. So what were the results and the key benefits of the work? So I believe we demonstrated that such viewpoints can help contextualize a system of systems architecture. We actually helped inform the capture of a reference architecture for our SATCOM system because we could provide that jigsaw pops cover going forward. And the architecture could consider that the S1 was the architecture we had, the S1 star was the architecture we wanted to get to, and two, three, and four were how we're gonna create it. The diagrams I showed you, obviously blobs, there's no real notation there, but there are enough to hang and start architect actually working and using the terms and making sure that reference architecture is fleshed out. So we can show how the S2, S4 would represent project scope within that architecture and how the S1 star and the S4 relationship could help show that interface and demand specifications on it going forward. So the systems thinking didn't do this, but it set the groundwork for architecture to start and that progress down that left hand side of the V. We've also demonstrated how it can help inform test and acceptance. So it informed the test and acceptance strategy we had these things of capability events that could be written into the logic around acceptance testing and know which program events are gonna provide evidence towards them. There's also a realization that capability events may not come from the program. For example, those terminals coming in was not in control of the scope of the program and that the interoperability, the potential impact actually does impact that, that overall capability, but those terminals don't exist yet. So you can't plan for exactly what you're going to test, but being aware that those events are going to happen 
to inform how you might do regression testing for your existing assets and show how that capability is either increased or maintained. And it can help show resilience with, as the context, the new context environment changes around you. And finally, we believe it generates benefits for portfolio and capability management. It shows that criticality of interventions, that future space asset, that new space asset we talked about. We could show very clearly that it, this, the capability that's been unlocked will be dependent on those terminals and ground stations being able to interoperate with that space asset in a clear and simple fashion. And this can result in further work being planned. And the business case, the reason and scope could be supported and articulated through such a holistic picture. So in conclusion, we believe that system thinking frameworks are extremely useful in helping these large system assistance programs to understand their whole picture and help them define how things are going to progress through time, in our case, these event-driven epochs. It help contributes to portfolio management, what you're doing, capability management, what you expect out of that, what, what you're doing, how do you measure that, and the acceptance strategies, what, what evidence can you show that you've done the work and are doing the right thing for each of those epochs. And by adding the time axis to Seven Samurai, and key representing each epoch as its own system of systems so we could apply the framework, allowed us to show a dynamic jigsaw box cover through time. And through it, we could demonstrate the link between the, the capability or the problems we're trying to solve and the interventions that we're making. When we're managing a complex problem, such as delivering this capability for a system of systems, sometimes it is necessary to simplify the complexity, and sometimes it might feel like we're actually stating the obvious. But sometimes it, you need to be able to have the bigger picture in order to spot these problems and spot that obvious, because the organisation may be blind to it in being deep down in delivery. This simplified um, the, the sort of the complex picture and show the implication of changes through these epochs. And finally, I would say that make sure that when you're selecting a framework to use in for such a problem, it's a mixture of how complete the framework is and how communicable it is. If you think the completeness can ensure that you're thinking holistically and making sure you, you look at everything and consider all the different types of systems across the, the lifetime of the system of systems, but key is the language and being able to communicate the insight to those who require it is even more important because that's when it becomes useful. In this case, we found Seven Samurai to work well. It may be that other frameworks work better for you, but I would experiment. That's what we did. We, we tried and, and see what benefits we could get. And we think it actually worked very well when trying to look holistically over this large scale system of systems. So thank you for um, coming along to this lunchtime talk. Um, I'd like to thank my co-authors as well, uh, Mike Jenkinson and Paul Wells, and also someone I worked with um, on the project, uh, Adrian Norton, for helping solidify this thinking and being able to produce the paper. Um, I'm going to take any questions now, um, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. All right, thanks, Tom. That was very interesting and thought-provoking. Um, I'm sure we've got quite a few questions lined up there. Okay, yeah. Peter, far away. Thank you, Malcolm. Yeah, and thanks, Tom, for a great presentation. Um, you you mentioned in in your presentation that um, language is one of the things that's a bit of a difficult barrier. Mm -hmm. uh, so often the, the terms we use with systems don't really don't really resonate, and and I, I, I agree with that. I've certainly experienced the same. One thing I find quite curious about the Seven Samurais is the is the labeling of S5, it calls it a collaborating system. And mm -hmm. um, when, for me, the description fits quite well with enabling system. And in my opinion, that's usually the sort of accepted term in the systems community is, is to use enabling system. Sure. So I, I'm wondering whether, I guess, just on that one, but probably broader, um, you know, did, did, co did collaborating system, did that really land? Uh, with the people you're communicating this to, did you use enabling system and, and was there one that was better or the other? So I think collaborating system worked well in this case because we might be providing that enablement to that, that system that's collaborating with us. So I would say in the case of the, the, the terminals, for example, consider them as a collaborating system because they're actually using the service we're providing. So they're not actually, they are releasing a bit of the capability. 
but without them we wouldn't be able to achieve our goal and vice versa so i think it's a kind of a two-way thing i think there are some definite enabling systems and that actually might fit within your sustainment but it just depends on if they're in or outside your boundary i guess at that point in time or your sphere of control okay okay so you think that sort of enabling systems it's it's not uh it's not one-to-one -one. it's possible that enabling systems fit across maybe other parts of s1 to, to s7 yeah i think so and i think the, the key i think the thing we're collaborating is they're working toward potentially their own goals as well and okay. you might not even realize that you're part of that system that you're just being consumed so there is that kind of two-way relationship whereas an enabling system very much is is helping you do your job which is probably would fit with most collaborating systems but in this case i think because of the nature of sat comment it, it worked quite well okay okay great but, but definitely def 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 take your point in that it could it could well be that in your case it might be enabling is, is a better word yep thanks for that the diagrams are still quite sort of conceptual um yes. how did you present the information to the senior management so actually when we we these were things that we wouldn't we wouldn't have shown <laughs> um, we basically would have divided this up and probably presented it in chunks much like before so the mm -hmm. the main view that was sort of landed the work was um was one sort, sort of like this right where yeah. it's simple enough that you can point and see things that they would recognize as as work or deliverable items but also show that that those things that exist outside their, their sphere of control um, and especially then going down into um, here where you would then show mm -hmm. the picture of what they're trying to build um, key there obviously the problems they might not have been aware of or maybe even can't solve so for example here the problem of p7 you're not going to solve that you just you, the, the fat space whether it's debris getting worse you're just going to have to find a way of dealing with it um and some might be negotiations such as the p8 problem trying to solve that orbit slots so mm -hmm. it's these sorts of pictures i think will come out of it and as i said one of the benefits was being able to inform the reference architecture work so you had kind of these pictures that will go up to uh seniors be able to see the whole picture so a program manager but actually for an architect or a solution architect, they could take this and move further down the stack and they, they could unpick it and make more detailed pictures, which would then be able to communicate to sort of systems engineers or solution engineers at that point. Okay, that's interesting. Thanks. If there are no further questions, I will thank Tom again for his paper um, and his presentation. It was very interesting. And there is a another one next Wednesday which will be the second in the series. So um, thank you all for attending and thanks to Tom for presenting to us. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day.